Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the name of our suffering Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In our readings today, Jesus tells us that to be a devout Christian, we must take up our cross and follow him as the world is hostile to his truth and we will suffer for our Christian faith. And yet any pains that we may suffer in this world pale in comparison to the pain that he suffered on our behalf. And because he suffered and died for us, it also pales in comparison to the eternal joy that he has won for us through his cross and his empty tomb. This morning our Lord comes to us through the words of divine service setting four as printed in the bulletin with our Lenten omissions and we rise to make our beginning. And as we gather in the presence of the one true and triune God, we look to our baptism where God himself called us by name, clothed us in his robe of righteousness and declared us to be heirs of his eternal kingdom. And so we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. We will bless the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for this, the second, sun, the second Sunday in Lent, comes from the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. 
No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a great of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. O oh, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and of our faith. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, the fifth chapter. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. We rise for the reading of the gospel. In the Holy Gospel, which serves as the text for a sermon this morning, comes to us according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. As Christians, we are called to be bold in this world, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to all. But this world makes it difficult as we are hated for our faith. We are hated for speaking the truth that the world does not want to hear. But we cannot be ashamed of our Lord Jesus Christ, for if we are, when he returns, he will be ashamed of us. If we renounce him in this world, we will be renounced as well. 
And so it is our joy and our duty to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to all, boldly living out and professing the Christian faith that Jesus has worked in our hearts through the power of his word. And so let us confess together that Christian faith as we speak together the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Get behind me, Satan. Could there be a stronger rebuke spoken by the Son of Man to one of his followers? Peter, who has seen so much, who knows that Jesus is the promised Messiah, who in his mind would do anything at all to protect and stand up for Jesus, Peter is not only told to step away, but is called the greatest enemy of Jesus Christ. Get behind me, Satan. What could Peter have done to have earned such a rebuke? Well, for starters, he pretty much called Jesus a liar. Jesus told the disciples very plainly what was going to happen in the near future, that he was going to be rejected, he was going to be tried and killed and resurrected. And in response, Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, to tell him, no, those things aren't right. That can't be true. Probably saying something like, oh, I mean, come on, Jesus, you know that's never going to happen to you. I mean, you're the man, Jesus. You're the Messiah. You wouldn't ever let something like that happen. You could stop all of that stuff with just one thought. So don't even talk such foolishness, Jesus. You won't ever let yourself suffer like that. Now, to be fair, Peter honestly thought that he was doing a good thing here, and he had noble intentions. He knew what Jesus could do to anyone who opposed him. He was confessing Jesus' power and strength. He was proclaiming Jesus as the victor. Peter thought that it was foolish to even think that Jesus would suffer at the hands of anyone much less die, because he knew that Jesus is God in the flesh. And so it's ridiculous to think these things could happen, and he tells Jesus so. But Jesus sets Peter straight. Firmly, harshly, and in no uncertain terms. Get behind me, Satan, he says, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Peter was right to an extent, but Peter had only earthly strength and glory in mind. Jesus had in mind something far greater. Peter thought that for Jesus to suffer and die meant defeat because Peter was only thinking of earthly things. What Jesus said was very hard for Peter to stomach. But rather than try to digest it, he takes it upon himself to assume that he, Peter the fisherman, knows far better than Jesus the Christ. Just like we ourselves do each and every day. We, like Peter, we hear God's word. And we, like Peter, we assume that we know better than God himself. We, too, tell Jesus, no, that's not the case. We rebuke him. We say, oh, come on, Jesus, that's just crazy talk. Because we, like Peter, are not setting our minds on the things of God, but on the things of man. We don't want to set our minds on the things of God because, let's face it, those things are hard. Jesus tells us that we will have to bear crosses. And we don't want to wear crosses. We want to have nice, velvety, plush couches. We want to have fine clothing. We want to have under armor. But that's not what we are called to bear. Jesus tells us that to be a Christian means to take up your cross. And crosses mean suffering. Living as a Christian in a world of unbelief, it is not going to be easy. The world hates God's truth, and it is going to do whatever it can to silence those who hold to that truth. It will shame you. It will cancel you. It will pass legislation that makes it illegal to dare speak out against the world's favorite sins of the moment. There are those whose lives are literally at risk because of their Christian faith. 
Now, thankfully, at this point, we are not to that point. We have Christian freedoms yet in this country, and we do not sit in fear of somebody bursting into our assembly right now to kill us or arrest us because we are Christians. But that's not the case everywhere. More Christians have been martyred in the 21st century than every other century combined. When we think of Christian martyrdom, we think of, you know, the gladiator games and the Roman Empire and Nero and his despicable acts. But the fact is, it's happening today, and it's accelerating. We who are blessed with such, such luxury, we who have had it so easy for several generations in the Christian faith, we don't want to bear those crosses. We don't want to think about suffering. At the least little inconvenience, we wilt and we wither and we cry out, Why would you let this happen to us, Lord? No, this can't be right. You mean I might get laughed at at work? You mean I might have to choose to put church before sports? You mean I might have to vote against a candidate who promises me more money just because they encourage the slaughter of babies and push homosexuality? I can't do that, Lord. There must be some mistake. But there's no mistake. To be a Christian is difficult. To live out your faith in an unbelieving world is not easy. And Jesus tells us that we are to deny ourselves. Our laziness, our greed, our gluttony, our desire for comfort and riches and wealth. We are to curb our sinful desires, even as the world shouts, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. We are to put others before ourselves, even if we are not benefiting from it. And we are to put Jesus Christ first and foremost in every part of our lives. Not just on Sunday mornings, not just when it's in gentle company and convenient to do so, but we are called to stand out from this world and to put ourselves at risk. And these things are hard, but that's what Jesus calls us to do. And then he asks for more. Then he calls for us to confess our sins and to confront others about theirs. We are sinners, and we are called to stand before God and admit that we are not an authority to ourselves, that we are not the bestest, smartest, greatest thing ever in the world, and we are also called to talk to others about their sin, to our family, to our friends, to strangers to warn them of the perils that come along with sin, to warn them of the eternal fires of hell that await those who reject the forgiveness of God, who try to rewrite his word and make it say whatever they want it to say, who tell the rest of the world that it's okay to do whatever you want because God is dead. We are called to confront that sin, not in hatred, not in anger, but in love knowing full well that the world will not see it that way. All these things are the hard things of God that we are called to do as Christians. And we don't want to put in the effort that it truly does take to put him first. We don't want to even set our minds on those things because we're sinners. We like to set our minds on the things of man. Because that stuff is easy, it's instant, it's tangible, it's the stuff that we like and what we want to do. We want to indulge our sinful desires and the world tells us to do it, so of course we're going to listen to that. The world says if it feels good, do it. No matter who else it hurts or how much it damages your faith or what pain it brings to you in the long run, don't think about the future. Think about the now and live like an animal, indulging any instinct and urge that you might have. Living according to God's word, it takes discipline. It takes restraint. And sin doesn't. 
Sin promises so much fun, so many easy rewards, so much instant gratification with no effort required whatsoever, even though it can't deliver on even one of those filthy promises. Even as Christians, as devout Christians, our focus is so often on the things of man as we want church to just be a place to give us an earthly treasure and boost. We want to come for the society of it, the friendship of it, kind of the nice kids club. We want to hear from the pastor 10 tips on how to live your best life now. And yes, we'll give to the church willingly as long as we get that promise that God will give it all back at a 300% interest. Pastor, just tell us how to get along with one another. Tell us how to get rich. Tell us what prayers we have to do to get God to open up his hand of blessing and make it rain dollar dollar bills up in here. So many of us think that church is just a convenient place to hear how to make our lives here on earth better or richer or more peaceful. And sadly, many churches cater to that kind of short-sighted thinking, and they focus on what you can do to fix your life, how to twist some Bible passages into a 12-step program that leads to earthly success. But Jesus asks a very pointed question regarding all of this. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his life? If church is just about improving your temporal life, guess what? It's not going to last. The things of man, they are deadly and they are temporary. Both Proverbs 14 and 16 say, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. The way of sin promises so much, but it delivers only shame and pain and death. Lust promises love and satisfaction, but it only leads to disappointment and heartache and emptiness. Greed promises to provide for us and to fill us, but it only consumes us as we want more and more and more. Power and fame promise to give us everything our heart desires, but instead it winds up taking everything from us instead. Setting our minds on earthly pleasures on sinful desires, they will never satisfy because it's never enough. Sin always wants more and more and more, and you cannot feed the beast. However much money we amass, if that's our focus, we will always want more. There will always be someone better off than us. However many physical pleasures we experience, if that's our goal in life, we will always be chasing after the next big thrill, the next thing to bring that rush. Whether it's fame or fortune or fantasy or feelings or anything that our sinful hearts try to put before God, it will always betray us. It will always pull the rug out from under us and it will always leave us empty and broken and dead. In fact, even the good earthly gifts, they are not going to last. It's not bad to pray for peace in your family, but understand that that peace will come to an end. It's not wrong to pray for earthly needs and even wants, but those things are going to wear out or be lost or simply not satisfy you anymore. It's not bad to pray for healing, but death will come to us all. And when it does, that's when we will fully appreciate having our minds set not on the things of man, but on the things of God. The things of man, they will always go away. They will always disappoint. They will always leave us in greater want. But the things of God, however, they last forever. Here in the church, we don't just receive earthly pep talks and how-to guides. We don't just have a nice social gathering together. Here we receive the eternal blessings of the one true and triune God himself. The creator of all things comes to us to give us of himself. Here we hear of how God humbled himself to come to us in the flesh. We are not just told that our sins will be forgiven someday, but by the power of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven 
here by the word of God. We are given the blessings of God's holy sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We are forgiven of all of our guilt. We are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And we are given not just hope, but the absolute eternal guarantee of everlasting life in heaven for all those who look to Jesus Christ in faith, who set their minds on the things of God. Ask yourself honestly, when you are lying on your deathbed, facing your final moments, do you want your pastor to be there telling you how to maximize your 401k? Or do you think that maybe then, and in fact, every time that you speak with him, it might be better to hear about the eternal victory that you have been given through the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, to hear about all of the eternal gifts and blessings and joys that your heavenly Father pours so freely into your lives. Gifts, not rewards. We're not rewarded for bearing our crosses just the right way. We are given gifts despite all of our failures. And even as we bear our crosses through this valley of the shadow of death, God himself is there, strengthening us, lifting us up, walking with us. Not always giving us everything that we want so we can live in luxury and ease because that's not good for us. Luxury isn't good as we rely on those temporary earthly things, as we lose sight of God and say, well, what do I need God for? I've got a full bank account. But instead, our Heavenly Father is there giving us all that we need, being our Heavenly Father who helps us grow in faith, to be strengthened in His Word, to learn to rely on Him instead of earthly props, to use the earthly suffering that we endure to build hope and character and steadfast love. That is where we should set our minds because that is what will never leave us, will never fail us, will never go away. The things of man, oh yeah, they seem pretty neat, and it's very easy for us as sinners to set our minds on those because they are easy, they're tangible, they are immediate. But they are temporary at best, and they are evil snares at worst. The things of God, they seem so hard because he talks about restraint and sin and bearing crosses, and those are not things that we sinners like to think about. But when we set our mind on those things, on the things of God instead of the things of man, we see such rich blessings poured out into our lives. Not necessarily in earthly riches and rewards, although living according to God's word definitely does spare us from a lot of heartache and pain. But as we deny ourselves, as we take up our crosses, as we set our minds on the things of God instead of the things of man, we see not earthly rewards that will disappoint us, but heavenly gifts that will never fade away. We see our guilt removed from us as far as the east is from the west. We see our sin-stained lives turned white as snow. Not by what we do or by how well we focus on God's word, but simply by the grace of our loving Heavenly Father, by the unfathomable riches that he has poured out upon us through his only begotten Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Set your minds not on the things of man, but on the things of God. For by his cross alone, by his empty tomb alone, you are forgiven of every one of your sins, and eternal life in heaven is yours. To God alone be all glory, now and forever. Amen. And now that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. O Lord God, in these Lenten days, set our minds on your things rather than the things of man, that we may deny ourselves Take up our crosses and follow your Son through this life into the joys of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you have given your church the joy of proclaiming the truth that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, 
so that we might be justified by his blood and saved from your wrath over our sins. Grant all, pastors, the gift of your spirit to preach and teach this truth boldly and faithfully and help each of us to confess it in word and deed in our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, keep us from being ashamed of the Son of Man when we face persecution for his name in this world, that he may not be ashamed of us when he comes in your glory with the angels. Be near to all those who are facing martyrdom for Christ and sustain them unto the end, that they may be crowned with life before you. Turn our culture from its wicked ways and open the eyes of those who hate you, that they may know your peace and forgiveness in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, since all kingship belongs to you and you rule over the nations, we pray that you would bless all those who govern us in your stead, that we may be ruled wisely and in accord with your will. Be with Joseph, our president, Kim, our governor, the members of Congress, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give us courage to speak out for the unborn and for our religious rights, and thwart the plans of all who seek deception, violence, injustice, or bloodshed. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, you have blessed your church with the cleansing waters of baptism. Be with those who celebrate their baptism birthdays this week, including Emily, Denny, Larry, Shelley, Benjamin, and Madison. Keep all Christians in mind of your eternal gifts and daily strengthen us by your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, through your Holy Spirit, pour your love into the hearts of all those who suffer in our midst, that their sufferings may produce endurance, endurance, character, and character, a hope that will not put them to shame. Grant them health and healing in accord with your perfect will, and sustain them in all their trials. Be with the sick and the dying, the lonely and forsaken, the scared and depressed, the addicted and the mentally ill, those affected by the weather, those separated from their loved ones, those recovering from or preparing for surgery, and all who suffer in any way of body, mind, or spirit, especially Joy, Edgar, Bob, Rodney, Darren, Alberta, all our shut-ins, those in nursing homes, and all those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, O Lord, Grant us, dear Father, for the sake of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Again, a welcome to all of you, and what a joy it is to gather together in God's presence, to hear his word, and even as he calls us to do the difficult things of setting our minds on the things of God instead of the things of man, to know that the things of God lead not to shame and pain, but rather to eternal life through the forgiveness that he has won for us in his cross and his empty tomb. God's richest blessings to each and every one of you on the rest of your week, and may he bring you back safely to his holy house in the days and weeks to come.